Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. Today, we're having a nice chilled sit down with Abel from Glass Bryn, the agroecological permaculture market garden. And it's gonna be a bit more like some of the other Q&As you may have seen on this channel before, where they're more just a kind of raw, fairly unedited, yes, I make out little bits here and there, but it's just a chat that I've got questions in today's video regarding the monthly tours. The, and obviously being now that we're at the end of it, kind of a bit of an evaluation and, mm -hmm. and highs, lows, challenges, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. to talk about over the previous year. Um, obviously a bit about the future as well as some questions from yourselves. So questions that we've people have put either in the comments below of the previous videos or um, when we've done shout outs on Instagram and things like that. So I suppose we can get started. Where should we start? I suppose evaluation over this previous year. So let's start with some 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 highs and lows, some challenges. So first of all, some highs and lows. What were some of the high points of the previous year mm. along with some of the low points? Um, in terms of the growing season, I think uh, high, high points were this uh, great squash harvest. I think of our pumpkin harvest. We had a really good year for that. Um, and a low point, probably the tough, I mean, the toughest part of the growing season this year was a dry spell that ran for quite a long time, mm. kind of, I think it was like May, in, May, most of May into June. Um, just a lot of, a long time of every evening watering and, and keeping everything watered. Um, thankfully, we had quite a bit of help from volunteers coming in the evening to help out. Um, so yeah, through that busy May, May, June time when you've got loads of planting to do, it was super dry, so there was also lots of watering. Um, and, and the annual stress about water supplies and having enough. And so, yeah, um, um, obviously there's the big high of, of uh, the big news that we received in July that, that we would become stewards, tenants, custodians of this amazing place, um, Lord's Park. Uh, that's the big high of this year. That's kind of an, an ongoing high ever since July. So, um, yeah, knowing that we've secured a long-term future for Glass Bread on this incredible, majestic, beautiful piece of land um, and the excitement of what we can do here as a project and um, with our community. So, yeah. Excellent. And you kind of touched on it there, some, some, some of the challenges. What have been some of the challenges that you faced this year? Have you got some, you know, maybe say top three or something mm -hmm. like that? A few kind of the key challenges and also how you overcame them. Mm. What maybe you learned along the way that you might not necessarily have known before or something you tried out that then succeeded? Um, uh, what, you know, I'll mention water again. Uh, water was the big <clears throat> thing that, that, I don't know if we overcame it, but we survived and the plant survived. Um, so the big lesson from that is as it is every year, like we need to store more and more water. Um, you know, there's plenty of rainfall in Wales, it's just harvesting it really is the key thing. And um, that's something I'll bring into this new project is like never again will I want, do I want to feel like we don't have enough water. So that's something to get in ahead of time is like getting the water supply in place first before you grow a gargantuan amount of veg. Um, I mean, thankfully we have the backup of mains water, but obviously we don't want to rely on that because it's expensive and it's also, you know, it's that straining, um, you know, aquifers and, and, and limited finite water resources. So we want to be harvesting the rainwater that falls on, on the land here and keeping things, um, keeping things in a closed loop on the farm. Um, so the question was... Challenges. Challenges. That you've overcome. Uh, um, probably like a lack of kind of people in terms of staff. Like I was doing a lot of it alone this year in terms of like the running and organizing of the place. Steph, my co-grower who I've been growing with for four years, um, he unfortunately had to move on from like day to day um, working on the land. So he's still a director of Glass Brand, but he, he um, unfortunately wasn't able to carry on working on the land from April onwards. So just as that dry spell began, I kind of found myself... Um, solo responsible so but again like we have this incredible volunteer community who really rise to the occasion and, and when 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 asked so um, but yeah that's again something 
to learn from is to is to try to have people in place to to spread the load because it's not it's not resilient for it to rely on one person because if I was to get sick or get injured or um, which I did I had a that was another <laughs> challenge was I got a broken not a broken rib I really damaged my my intercostal muscles in in the same April May time somewhere around there so I was also doing that period with with severely damaged ribs. So if I look back, it's kind of crazy to think back at that time because there's a period where I was writing the proposal for this in a very short three-week window, doing the watering, doing all the planting, and had a very damaged ribs uh, at the same time. So yeah, it's, it's crazy to think back at that time. Thankfully I made it through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so... I think especially with where we are now and how much has changed over this year and, and how much things have changed that we weren't necessarily thinking about. Like, yes, in one sense, the monthly tour videos, once you told us about moving here, it kept, became a bit tricky to do a monthly video because mm. not much was happening mm. as, as yeah, opposed yeah. to what would happen. But with, obviously, with everything in mind like that, taking what you, what did you learn Yes, after over this year, obviously over previous, you've been there what seven years now at the old Casperin. Mm -hmm. What have you learned there that you're now going to be taking into this site here? Mm. Um, I mean, there's a lot that really worked well over there that I will take into this. So a lot of the a lot of the approaches we took to growing um, are very scalable and uh, kind of solutions. So, for example, um, you'll remember how we grew how we lay our beds on contour. Um, with kind of level ditches in between full of wood chip that absorb water and create um, a great habitat for beneficial fungi, um, store water. So that's, that's a practice that I, I would take through now to any piece of land is to work with the contour lines of the hills because there's very little truly flat land. So most land has some kind of contour to it. Um, so working with that, working with trying to store as much water in the land as possible. Um, so yeah, we continue a lot of those practices. They've proven to build deep beds of, of super rich, lively soil very quickly. So with these no-dig approaches that we've been taking, so I'd always take that forward because it allows you to transform a piece of land into just an incredible growing site relatively quickly. So um, I suppose that's given me the confidence that we can grow on anything. Because some of the land that we were using in our previous site was, you know, made up with sh uh, shale and rubble. It wasn't, it was, you know, t technically the worst, probably the worst growing land you could imagine. Um, so obviously we're not dealing with the same thing here because we have better, better quality mm. land to use. Um, but a different type of soil, which is going to be interesting. Okay. So what... So actually, uh, yeah, I want to get onto that. How is the soil different, you know, and, and, and the, the comparisons between the two? But also, um, what has the majority of the, the land been used for in the past? Um, so yeah, here? so this farm has, has been has been a extensive dairy farm for quite a long time, I think. So um, just kind of small scale, traditional style dairying. Um, I don't think there's been a huge amount of inputs or... or, or uh, synthetic fertilizers um, or over over slurrying or over manuring I think it's been managed kind of in the traditional sense of a sort of tenant farm and before that um, if we go way back there was wheat and oats grown here um, it was quite a, you know it was a mixed farm producing lots of different types of food there's, there's evidence in the historical documents of it um, contributing to the war effort you know growing food potatoes pulses um, grains to, to contribute to the war effort to help feed the nation. So um, it was really a, a mixed farm um, going way back. Um, so the land's in, in pretty good shape, really. It's not overly compacted. Um, what we're dealing with here is, is so different in terms of soil. So at our old site um, is a very heavy clay, white clay soil. Um, here we've got the red sandstone soil. So th the soil is very red in color. Um, it's got a nice little clay content in it, um, slightly acidic, but yeah, so it's kind of um, traditionally, I think, what's what's valued in, in West Wales for potato growing. So in Pembrokeshire, that's why 
a lot of potatoes are grown out there because of this red sandstone soil. Um, so I'm really interested to see how it is for veg production particularly um, and, and what differences. I'm, my sense is it might be a little less nutritious, um, but maybe easier in other ways, like the tilth may be easier for certain vegetables. So it'd be interesting. We'll see. And obviously yeah. it will change over time, Yeah, you know, when yeah. you put more nutrients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the comments is actually, thank you, Ray, Jeff, for uh, uh, commenting about, he loved your idea that you mentioned in one of the previous months of taking, even if just a handful, obviously it might take a little bit more than that, but taking a bit of the soil that you've spent that time and energy mm -hmm. and the nature has spent time and energy to, to add to, and you're going to start off a little bit of um, the pasture, a little bit of the growing here, with that, mm. Mm. yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I'll cut this bit because <laughs> I just thought, shall I go down that route or shall I go down that route? I know what route I'm going to go down. We'll go on to questions next. Sure. So first of all, we're going to go with a question from purely because he has commented on almost at least half, if not almost all, of the videos that we've done. And has when I asked for questions, he's asked questions. So thank you to Ben Moffitt for all your amazing comments and your questions so far. It, yeah, I've mentioned it before. It still feels like I feel like an imposter making these videos, and it's like, well, why? Why should you bother listening to these ones that we make? And at the same time, an imposter for like able, you know, people pay to get your knowledge just to ask you these questions. Um, but to have people actually watching these videos, commenting and get engaging with them, um, yeah, is great. So, mm -hmm. like I said, we'll start off these questions with Ben's question, which is, given that Glassbren has already offered courses and workshops, would they have any interest in starting a formal school there centred, so here, centred around permaculture, regenerative agriculture and sustainable living, etc.? Um, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, something we would be interested in doing. I think, I think we certainly see it becoming kind of a centre for regenerative education. Um, whether that transmutes into a formal school or not, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly education is really front and centre in what we want to do here. And that's, that's broader than just uh, food growing or farming. That's going to extend into... Um, kind of nature connection work, deep ecology, deep ecology um, foraging, uh, you know, coastal and field and woodland foraging, um, cooking, food literacy, you know, all these, like there's so much possibility. And so um, I could imagine that that's something that could happen in the future, but I think in the, in the meantime, we'll be offering a lot of educational work, whether we're a formal school or not, I'm not sure. Um, one part of the vision is to create something called the Little Stewards. This is um, Louisa's kind of pet project and um, that's going to be something of a school, uh, a sort of um, program of kids' activities for home educated kids, um, for school kids as well, for early years educators. Um, and that's going to be kind of a truly nature-based learning environment for, for children. So it will offer the opportunity to develop ecological, emotional, intellectual skills whilst whilst getting very practically involved with the land and um, being part of restoring landscapes and, and ecosystems. So um, that's something we're really, really excited about is, is yeah, working with children and young people because that's that's really the future. So, um, yeah. So, um, and I suppose kind of, to me, it goes secondary to Ben's question. <clears throat> Maybe the reason he's asking about formal is... Um, there being almost, uh, whether it be online or a place to go to get some of this yeah. uh, information, in what ways will you be educating yeah. from in-person to for, uh, online? Yep, so uh, in-person we'll have um, everything from day workshops uh, up to two week long residential courses. So um, I'm teaching on a permaculture design certificate this summer um, with Nim Robbins. Um, that's going to be actually at their site in North Pembrokeshire because we're not quite ready this summer to to host big groups for long long amounts of time. And to be honest, there's not a lot to show yet. So, uh, but next summer we'll be hosting that two week course here 
uh, Lord's Pup. Um, we'll also run one week long things. We'll, there'll be either highly educational experiences or more kind of retreat type experiences where it's more about being held in this landscape. Um, uh, so we're, yeah, we're really excited about offering those two different types of, of prospects for people. Um, and initially with camping accommodation, but we will be developing dorm accommodation for people to stay in. Um, and yeah, food will be a big feature of that and types of food, the type of food that we cook here, glass brain. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, and then having school groups come and, and doing the, the little steward stuff too. So it'll be lots of different, lots of different ways. And then I'd love to do more online online courses for those who can't make it down to the farm. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you again, Ben. So Thanks, ben. we have um, another question here. Who should we go with next? Um, <clears throat> so this comes from friend of us, friend of the channel, Chanel or Anuna Healing, as uh, the YouTube channel is known as, um, as well as many other channels. So Chanel asks, I would love to know if they have any stories on overcoming some of the hardships they have perhaps faced. So, it, for example, you know, it can't have always gone smoothly and, mm. you know, look at the great achievement you've made so far. Mm. And I'm just going to... Echo is with us and she's laid down. There are some lights in the room just to brighten up the room and I don't want her to... I'm just wary of her. If you see me looking off screen... It's just to check that she's not walking into a cable. Overcoming adversity. Hmm. I have to think about this one for a minute. I guess I'd have to say just like the experience of the pandemic. I think that's what comes to mind is, is um, you know, the challenges that that brought for everybody. Uh, everybody who runs a business, everybody's lives. Um, and I'm really proud of how we adjusted and, um, what's the word, uh, pivoted, I guess is the word, to adapt to that as a team. And we were a bigger team then, or we became a big team early in the pandemic. And, um, you know, the way, we, the way we saw what was happening with food insecurity and, and um, people not being able to get to supermarkets and supermarket shelves being empty and pivoting quickly to how we could fill that gap a little bit with our VegBox scheme. Um, and at the same time, this like demand amongst kind of furloughed workers for purpose and for something to be positive to be involved in that was health giving and life giving and um, yeah, to be, to be able to respond to that quickly. Uh, I'm really proud of the team, the way that they did that. And uh, the way that we really became a, t a tight, cause we were kind of a tight, this tight bubbled unit where we couldn't really see, spend time with our families um, or our friends. So it's just us there. And I remember building an extension to the shed together through a really cold winter of like the worst winter of the pandemic when everything was shut down and you couldn't really see anyone when Christmas got canceled that, that year. Um, yeah, what could have been a really, what could have been a really hard thing um, that wiped out a lot of businesses and I'm really proud of how we, I guess, showed like what 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 um, the potential of CSAs, the potential of community food enterprises to respond to crises. Um, something I'm really proud of. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. That was in in the, yeah in the in the atmosphere of isolation and and not being able to do things that we're used to doing and be with people that we want to be with. Um, I was proud of how this project and the people involved could could kind of meet some needs in that time. Yeah. Thank you, for Chanel, for Thanks, that one. Chanel. So next question comes from Fahim Reza. He says, it's exciting to see your permaculture journey unfold. As you observe and interact with the new land during the winter, what are some specific challenges and opportunities mm. you anticipate in implementing permaculture design at Lords Park Farm? Yeah. Uh, so the main design challenges that I've identified so far would be wind, number one, massive one. Um, we're right on the promontory of the coast, so we've got pretty, pretty, yeah, probably the worst kinds of winds you could imagine for this part of the world hitting us at full force. Um, 
So that's a big one. So I'm thinking to the opportunities there in terms of agroforestry and tree planting for shelter belts uh, and in every system integrating shelter belts as a, as a, as a rule, you know, um, everything from big field scale shelter belts to smaller shelter belts um, that protect the market garden in a very, um, uh, in a very close way. Um, so that's one of the big ones. I mean, one of the big opportunities is, is I talked earlier about, I didn't, one of the big opportunities is um, the amount of wildlife that's already here, the amount of life that's, that's filled this land um, that was already here before, but also with three years of not being farmed, um, a, lot of, a lot of life has kind of repopulated, re-inhabited this land. So um, we'll be spending some really great time with, with barn owls that live here. Um, so there's a few barn owls nesting in the, in the sheds. Um, there's so much rodent life in the pastures. This, I was saying to Jason earlier, I was sitting down in the pasture the other day and just in a dinner plate size area of grass directly in front of me, I could count over 20 spiders there. So there's a lot of life here. So that's, that's a really big plus point from a design perspective because we've got a lot to work with, a lot of life that's already here. We don't have to work really hard to bring life back into it. Um, a limitation or a, or a design challenge is, uh, particularly with the veg growing, is that we don't have any organic matter here. So we don't have the materials that we're used to having at our old site, where we're used to having a ready supply of manure, for example. Um, it was very easy to get grass cuttings. Uh, yeah, we've had quite abundant supplies of wood chip in the past. So yeah, we're building up from nothing in that respect. So that feels quite a bit of a challenge that might hinder us in the early going because, um, yeah, we're going to have to find that from somewhere until we have animals here on the farm that can produce manure and until we can produce our own wood chip. Um, as long as we're reliant on donated wood chip, it's, it could be um, a bit limiting. But um, and, then, and then in terms of the people side of the permaculture design, uh, just the fact that this farm is so perfectly situated for, for being a people facing permaculture project you know we have the Wales coast pass co comes directly through the farm so people are interacting with the farm all day long every day um, there's a lot of this farm means a lot to a lot of people in, in the village here uh, and, and in the villages surrounding here because it's a big part of the history of the place um, and the story of the place so that's another big benefit in the sense that this farm has has eyes on it it has a spotlight on it and and that gives us the opportunity to, to reach as many people with permaculture as, as possible. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Fahim. I'm probably speaking more than you want. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. A three hour I've video. got to just see. My oh, eyes look terrible. So Hope I think we're still good. Yeah, we've just moved on to the second card, so we're all good. So, no, all good, all good, we're all fine, nice. we're all fine. Um, okay, so I asked everyone for varying questions, not necessarily broad picture questions. Um, so I've got a, quite a specific question, and this one is actually from my auntie and uncle. Oh, hello. Uh, so this is Linda, Auntie Linda and Uncle Brian. Um, <clears throat> they ask, so they were told to harvest potatoes after flowering, but they grew too quickly. Mm -hmm. Why do they bolt? So I think it's because they, 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 they basically had a... Uh, and not a great experience with growing potatoes last year, um, and this being one of the key points that uh, Linda followed, and it didn't seem to work. So, uh, I guess answering that one, but also sort of mm. helpful growing potatoes. Um, so a bit hard to say without knowing kind of when you planted them, uh, the way that you grew them, but generally speaking, if a plant bolts, it's because it's it's because it's stressed. So a plant. Um, feels under stress and uh, wants to wants to replicate to survive. So it creates a flower, creates seed. Um, essentially, so that's the same with any plant. So what you what you know by it bolting is that that plant is under stress. So it could be that they got too dry, didn't have enough water, and that stressed them, and so they bolted. Um, that's probably the most likely scenario I can imagine. Um, they could be could have been nutrient deficient. I don't know what your soil situation is, but yeah, generally speaking, as a rule, if a plant bolts too early, it's, it's because it's stressed. So you need to look at why you think that plant might have been stressed, I suppose. <coughs> um, so it could be weather, it could be pest pressure, it could be nutrients, um, it could be water. 
And is that, do most of those relate also to potatoes? Um, because the, the reason I ask that is because mm. I, for, for, I've only grown them a few times and had family members. And uh, for example, like Alicia's mum grew them in bought compost from the shop, yeah. very nutrient rich compost, yeah. put the potatoes in it, they bolted and did nothing else. Yeah, we grew potatoes in quite poor soil yeah. um, and they did brilliantly. Yeah, I mean, it could be that they were too, there was too much nutrients because potatoes aren't, aren't a sort of hungry plant. So um, it could be that there was just too much nitrogen or, you know, too much, too much in that compost for them. Yeah, so, <coughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a sort of guess, educated guess, I suppose. Okay, well, uh, I suppose I was just, just trying to, you know, give you even more follow-up. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, again, we're go let's go, keep, keep it on potato super niche. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of key pointers or things that have led to success for yourself in yeah. growing potatoes, whether it be varieties yeah. or ways of yeah. growing them? Um, I would say with spuds, I've always um, thought about carefully about frost, so um, frost damage is a real thing with potatoes in this country because we can have quite late frosts. So timing is quite key of when you get your potatoes in the ground, if you want to get them through the frost. Um, they'll come back from a light frost. They won't, you know, they might, if you if you find there's a frost and your, your plants all look dead and, and browned, um, it's likely that they'll recover from that. But successive frosts might really hit them hard. So that's something to be aware of. Um, generally, no, and if you, Depending on what scale you're growing potatoes, I would always go with the no-dig approach to potatoes. Now, there's a few different versions of this. Some people might have heard of the Ruth Stout version um, or method, which uh, essentially just means you're growing potatoes under a, a mulch of, of hay, essentially. So with all no-dig potato methods, essentially it's rather than digging into the ground and heaping up, you know, the traditional way of growing potatoes has been to sort of stick them in a ditch and then heap up the soil around them and just keep heaping the soil and that's a lot of digging and, and, and a lot of work um, and does make the potatoes a little bit vulnerable in my view so the, the, the no dig method is essentially just sticking a potato on the ground um, maybe on a layer of cardboard and then just heaping organic matter on top of them as they grow so um, that has two benefits one uh, it feeds the soil so you're building really really great beds in the process of growing spuds um, makes them very easy to harvest. You know, you can harvest them just with your bare hands. You don't need to dig them out, um, which obviously reduces the risk of damaging them with, with tools. Um, and in my view, grows a better potato because you don't have to worry about water logging, um, rotting, because generally speaking, that creates very well draining, um, dry conditions for the potato to grow in. So um, yeah, the more you can add organic matter as they grow, the more potatoes you're gonna get. So. Um, whether it's the root stout method with hay, or whether you're just layering compost on top of there, uh, I think I've heard I've heard of lots of ways of doing this with sheep's wool or other other types of organic materials like that. So um, yeah, go no dig with spuds um, unless you're growing on a field scale. I'd, I'd grow no dig with spuds always. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Auntie Linda, and Uncle Brian. Um, next question. <laughs> There's a theme. With these, some of these questions, Is it because we didn't get lot. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't get lots and lots of uh, comments. So the theme being, we have uh, auntie and uncle, we have friend of the channel, and final question is from my mum. Hey, mum, and she asks, where would you? So personally, not necessarily Glassbren. Where would you like to be in ten to fifteen years? Well, that's a good question, mum. Um, in 10 years, where would we like to be? So it's interesting because our lease of this farm is 10 years, so it's a good period of time to think about. Um, in 10 years, where would, where, like, I would like in 10 years to feel like all of the permaculture systems are in place and growing. So I'd like to think that the land is full of trees and full of tree systems that are well established. So maybe producing fruit and producing the things that we want to harvest from them. Um, that there's, you know, 10 times as much habitat here as there is now. Um, I'd like to think that all of the enterprises that are running and have people running them 
um, that we have a good team in place here who um, can run the educational work and the CSA edge boxes and the, um, the events and community outreach and all those different elements are kind of running well on their own. Um, yeah, and I look forward to sort of, yeah, feeling like a coordinator, a conductor of the whole symphony of the thing. Um, looking after a teenager yeah. by that point. And looking after a teenager, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, I'll have a 14 year old by then. So um, it'd be nice to think there's more time then in 10 years time. That would be a big aim of mine would be to... This is your to plan because in, in a way, you, you know, you, sometimes you say it's a good and a bad thing. Sorry, just be careful of scratching your mind. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, you, you are in a way the face, but at the same time, you don't necessarily, it's not all coming from yeah. yourself. And yeah. is that something that maybe will be in 10 years, yeah. that you maybe have people that are almost more in control of certain areas yeah. and then you yeah. are, are able to take yeah. a step back in others? I mean, that's key with this, you know, it's a big vision and and whilst we're, we're living here and we're kick-starting it, I think it, the only way it can really be realized is, is with lots of different people and lots of energy and lots of different skill sets. And um, yeah, I suppose it's my hope maybe you know, within 10 years that, that that feels like that's in place and it's a shared enterprise um, between lots of people. And also a big intention I've made from day one is that, is that this is fun and that this that I I and we as a family and can enjoy the life here because it's a really special place to live and there's so much potential in terms of getting out on a canoe on the estuary or you know um, having horses and working in horse training or um, just to, just being in the land and, and you know camping out in the land observing wildlife that live here. Um, swimming every day in, in, at the beach, like, you know, just making sure that enjoying life is, is central to it for, for us and everybody that's involved. Um, it's not just about work and not just about the project and the mission and, you know, these things are really important to me and, and I always drive towards them, but, but I know that to do that, I need to balance it with play and fun and life. Um, and uh, yeah, presence and mindfulness, I guess, too. Yeah. yeah. Sounds pretty good to me. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it for the questions today. But before we go, so um, this, I'm trying to think, how should we introduce this, everybody? I think, first of all, it's just to open your eyes. Whoa, so, what is this? I felt like I wanted to just give you, I felt like I wanted to give you something just to commemorate, you know, like a homewarming gift. And the reason that uh, this became, uh, I was like, yeah, that'll work, is because this is from the beach down at Lost oh, Park Farm. It? Do you remember wow, when we yeah. were here filming the stuff that then ended up being the like press release? I collected that on that day. And when we went home that day, you had to go out and get some um, bits and pieces for yeah. the move. Yeah. And I went and sat by at Bronhall and was weaving something. That's And that's where the willow comes from is. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. The old place. Thanks, brother. Good heart, mate. Oh, look at that, everyone. Yeah. This guy is very, Don't know what it very, is. has very quickly. Still not, for, still, not, still not sure what it is or whether it's a sculptural piece, whether it's uh, Jason's but become very, very quickly, very talented at, at what is it, free weaving, you call it wild weaving, free weaving? I don't even know what it is. It's just weaving, I think. It's just weaving. It's, it's like just, weaving, this but is... not, in a, not in a typical pattern that you might be used to from baskets. But Yeah, so it's this is the, the style is like random weave. If you're random interested, there are, there are other videos on the channel about it. But it's. Uh, I reckon this is this like is a centerpiece just... of a table or something. This is a... Yeah, I think the idea is that it could possibly be used as a. You could put things in it as well. Um, yeah, I don't egg, think it's something that would be carried too much because it's not super yeah. strong. Because of the way I wove it, yeah. it's a little bit, little bit delicate there, right? But uh, it's beautiful, man. But yeah, I like the idea. When I found that, when I sort of when it clicked, that I was like, oh yeah, it's from both sites. Yeah. It's something made out of both sites and just yeah. Something. So it's like the, the last site woven into the new site. 
That's beautiful. And if you're interested, they'll be available now. <laughs> no, I don't have an available Etsy for or commissions. <laughs> yeah, available for commissions, one-offs. Because yeah. already someone's asked me to do something twice, and uh, I was like, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can redo <laughs> redo a thing. Okay, but there we are. So for today, for the end, this is the, the last video of this year that we started out. We're going to be doing lots more. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about canoe videos. I am determined now to get this camera out on a canoe out in the estuary, but also um, so many different more projects. Hopefully sort of smaller tutorials. I'm going to probably use it as a base maybe to do some kind of willow and weaving projects from here. So it might be more me and less able, as well as maybe some that aren't necessarily month by month, but whether they be tutorial or more story based about things going on at Lords Park Farm or Park A. Park Arargloes. Arargloes. It's Welsh for Lord's Park. Still, still, still can't. It's a bit of a, yeah, it's a tricky one. It's a bit of a mouthful. Park Arargloes. Um, um, so, with that in mind, we are hoping that these videos are still watched by lots of different people in the years to come. Um, and it's not that they just had a one year kind of uh, time limit. So, if you do have any questions for Abel, the, into the future I'll keep an eye on this channel so please put them down in the comments below and if we get quite a lot of questions then I could potentially just make a new video um, that is again just a question like this one just question by a uh, question and answer based video um, but other than that thank you again thank you all for and watching thank you everyone for the questions and everything and for watching throughout the year and we'll um, see you in the next yeah, one big thank you to Jason for um creating such high quality, informative, great storytelling for these videos. And um, for me, it's been a privilege to be part of it uh, and to have our journey documented in such a way. So yeah, big applause to Jason from Thank all you. of us. There's, there's a reason that on my phone right now, I, where Apple does the, it makes montages of people on yeah. your phone. I have less montages of Alicia, my <laughs> wife, than I do of this gentleman here. And it's like one of them, it actually called it early moments together. Mm, yeah. And it's just this sort of <laughs> yeah. like love story. I mean, probably no one has listened to my voice more than this man over yeah. the last year. So so maybe we're not going to be doing any problems. Maybe, we, maybe we need a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just going to take some time out from each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good place to end. Yeah, All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> bye bye. Brilliant. Nice.